I'd like to invite you to uh, grab a cookie and uh, a drink and have a seat. Uh, we're ready to start the all-faculty meeting. Uh, I'm Jane Gillespie. I'm president of the Faculty Senate, and it's a great pleasure for me to welcome so many people to this, this meeting. Uh, I think it's a sign that we, we have a very important topic today. It's, it's also a topic that we, we ran across the faculty by way of a survey uh, to find out what you wanted to hear about. And what we found out was uh, the Lincoln program and also uh, shared governance were of interest. So we've combined the two. Uh, and as I said, we have a very interesting program. Um, I'll be talking to you for a few minutes about the Faculty Senate. Uh, then we'll have uh, Ann Boyle, our interim provost, uh, will uh, talk to the group. Uh, then Kathleen Tunney is going to talk about Bridge. Uh, Paul Bronco will be uh, talking about the Lincoln program and the transition that was made from the Bridge to the Lincoln program. So in that way, we'll get uh, the history uh, of this program. Uh, and then Xenia Augustine will be t uh, talking about the upcoming rollout of the Lincoln program and, and what's going to happen. Uh, then we'll give you the opportunity to uh, uh, join roundtables and discuss uh, the new courses that are going to be associated with this, this program. So uh, it uh, looks like a, a, a good program and a good afternoon. Uh, so what I want to talk to you about is uh, these things. Uh, who and what is the Faculty Senate? Uh, what have we done this year? Uh, what role does shared governance play in what we're doing so far? Uh, and then just a slight philosophical comment about whether we're proactive or reactive. Uh, so let me ad address the second thing first. Uh, this is going to be very short. You have a spreadsheet uh, in your program that shows the actual action items that we've done. Uh, and I got so uh, filled up with the other topics that uh, I I left the, some of those out. So that sort of turned into the long reach of the Faculty Senate, uh, which is what I really uh, wanted uh, to talk about. So who or what is the Faculty Senate? You could go to our, our uh, Constitution, and uh, if, you, if you looked at the Constitution, you'd say that we were the body that is empowered to act as the agent uh, for the university faculty that we formulate policies in regard to all academic matters uh, and other matters of faculty concern. You could also go to our web page. Uh, I know you can't read this, but uh, I'll help you out. Uh, if you look uh, over above this up, up here where this, this paragraph is, uh, this is sort of a working definition of the faculty senate. Uh, and for future reference, uh, if you look over here on the left-hand side, uh, you see these panels, uh, there's actually a lot of information in this gray area. Um, these are active links uh, that talk about the membership of the councils. Uh, if you move down, you can get the, the, the uh, bylaws of the uh, councils and the Senate, uh, and also uh, the uh, minutes of the meetings and the agendas. So if you want to know uh, what the Senate's up to, uh, you can go to the website and look at this link. You will also find on the website, okay, oh, let's go back. Let's look at that definition then because it, it uh, enhances it a little more. It says the Faculty Senate represents the entire faculty uh, in organizing faculty governance uh, and on all matters that are relevant to the educational interest of the university. And important point, it is the communication link between the faculty and higher administration. <laughs> so the Faculty Senate is the body that's empowered to act for the Senate and to uh, communicate with uh, higher administration. Okay. You'll also find that we have 50 senators. These are elected senators. They're apportioned according to the numbers of faculty uh, in each college or each school uh, in CAS and library, and this is how it turns out. Um, you'll also be able to see uh, information about the Faculty Senate Executive Committee. Uh, this is the committee that sets the agenda and therefore determines the, the, um, the actions of uh, the Faculty Senate. 
and it is comprised of the officers, which are the presidents, that would be myself. Uh, President-elect is Rhonda Comrie, past president is John Pettibone, uh, and the chairs of the councils. Now, there are four councils uh, in the Faculty Senate, the Curriculum Council, Sue Wiedeger is the chair of that one, uh, Faculty de Development is Brian Duckham, uh, Welfare is Ken Moffitt, Rules and Procedures, Morris Taylor. So these are, are Senate councils, but we also have representation from the chair of the UPBC, uh, and that's uh, <laughs> Tim Schenecker. And we have uh, the graduate council chairs, Marcus Augustine. So, uh, and I'll, I'll say, uh, a chance to say this in public, this is a great group to work with. Um, but another, so moving on and talking about uh, the councils in, in the process. Uh, when the Senate <coughs> uh, receives something to work on, uh, it comes first to the executive committee and they refer it to a council. And the, you can pretty much tell what the councils do by looking at the names of the council. Uh, and so if it's a curriculum matter, it goes to the curriculum council, uh, which deals mostly with, this is a key word, it deals with undergraduate curriculum. But what we see here also uh, is the membership. So there are 11 elected senators, but there are also two students, uh, and there are eight ex officio members, seven from the provost's office, uh, and then the chair of, of uh, Gen Ed. Uh, if we look at another of the councils, uh, we, the Faculty Development Council, uh, also some key words up there for what they do. Uh, there are 11 senators and there are three ad hoc members. Uh, the EUE director, we have somebody from IT services, and we have a representative from the provost's office. So this is my first point of saying that we, this is, if not shared governance, it is at least shared responsibility uh, that we have been, that we're doing uh, in, the, in the Faculty Senate. Uh, then the Senate also is represented uh, by and has represented to, representatives to uh, several um, state and other university uh, committees and boards. So. Uh, the University Planning and Budget Committee, the past president serves on that. Right now that's John Pettibone. Uh, we have a representative to the Illinois Board of Higher Education. Uh, we also have representatives from ICAC and from ATSIC, and that's not all. John is working to, to try to figure out how many uh, representatives we actually do have. I have five minutes left? Oh my God. Uh, so also the Senate, the Senate president uh, attends the Board of Trustees meetings, uh, meets with the Chancellor and Provost on a regular uh, basis, and the Senate receives rep regular reports from HR, uh, IT, and the Provost. So we, this is what I'm talking about, the long reach of the Senate. The Senate represents uh, the faculty, uh, not only to the administration, but to most of the major uh, boards, committees, et cetera, in the, uh, the state uh, and the university. So uh, the, the, this body is empowered to organize faculty governments, uh, to represent the faculty, and it is comprised of elected faculty representatives. Uh, and then what have we done this year? Uh, I want you to refer to your handout for that. Uh, it's a classroom talk. but. Uh, what is not there is the fact that every time there's an important search that is going to happen, the Faculty Senate uh, appoints a member to, uh, to that body. So uh, we have uh, representatives to the Chancellor's search and also to the, currently to the Associate Provost for Research and the and Dean of the Re Graduate School. And whenever there is an evaluation of, of a Dean, uh, the Faculty Senate uh, participates in that as well. Uh, so, this brings me to my question. So, I hope, I hope you get the, the point that I was trying to make, is that the Faculty Senate does uh, not only represents a faculty uh, in a lot of different ways. Uh, but uh, this question, are we proactive or reactive? I, 
uh, I was asked if we had goals, and uh, this bothered me because I was reading Stephen Covey's book, and I knew if we weren't if we weren't proactive, we were nothing. Uh, but uh, we we are kind of a reactive body because things come to us, you know, and then we figure out what to do with it. But there are times when we get hold of something, and our reaction is very proactive. And here are some examples of things that I've been involved in since I've been on the Senate. Uh, the first four things, uh, I was on the Welfare Council and we, we did this, uh, and then the last thing, the Bridge to the Lincoln Program, we're talking about that today, that's huge. Uh, so these are faculty initiatives that came out of the Faculty Senate. And we keep this going, these are some of our uh, recent working groups and task forces. Uh, and again, John is trying to keep, uh, get uh, a list of those together for us. So uh, then uh, the question of shared governance, what role is that playing? Uh, at least we're, we've got shared responsibility. But today uh, at our faculty senate meeting, we will have our first reading of a definition of shared governance. And this is an effort to formalize the process. And there are two things that could happen. Uh, that this will set in motion if this is, is passed in April. Um, we will start to try to define uh, the relationship between the administration and the, and the faculty. Uh, and this is, this is John's diagram from last year, and I'm going to go past it because um, we, uh, we talked about it last year, but basically what, what we are trying to do is if the if the faculty is all the way over on the right, the administration is all the way over on the left, uh, this is a continuum. Where do we come together and uh, where do we stumble? Uh, what are the, you know, are there rules that we need to make? But another thing is if we um, uh, start to uh, pass this shared, shared governance, uh, then this will uh, implement Senate reorganization. So there are things already uh, in the statement about re uh, reorganization that are uh, measures that should promote uh, faculty communication. And so uh, this is something that uh, the Senate really needs to look at. We need to promote uh, communication between the faculty Senate and the faculty. Uh, we need to pro promote communication between the faculty and their own department, schools, deans, chairs, uh, and the faculty senate and all of those entities. Um, and we need to also promote communication among the departments and schools. Uh, I'd like to see some of you in, in Alton more often, but uh, it's possible that uh, these interdisciplinary studies that will be started, this will be a good start on that, but these are things that need to happen to have strong shared governance. Uh, we need a strong and involved faculty. So, um, and the, the last thing. Uh, I want to thank Vicki Cruz for putting this together today. Um, and I okay, and now I will introduce uh, Dr. Boyle. She's our interim provost. Thank you, Jane. Good afternoon. Now, I have to say, I came to this meeting last year, and I stayed for the whole thing. 
and the most people that ever showed up was 32. So I guess there's nothing like a good controversy to get the crowd out. <laughs> so thank you for coming. I think it is important that we have these kinds of meetings and these kinds of discussions. Um, well, let's see if we're going to do it. Oh, that doesn't. Oh, it doesn't work? <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, that All right, too. that worked too. Okay. okay. So I'm going to talk very briefly about the SIUE experience and the new freshman seminar. I'm going to talk about shared governance, and I have been given a 15-minute limit. Now, I've worked with Jane for a lot of years. If you don't know, she's a microbiologist. And when Jane says, it's really, really okay if you're under 15, but if you go over 15, it's going to be a huge problem. I realized that I could come down with some terrible disease. <laughs> so I'm going to try very hard <laughs> to stay under the limit, and uh, Jane knows that I don't do that well, which is why she warned me. Uh, I do want to say to you, I really regret uh, what happened with the uh, experience. And, uh, you know, this happened on my watch, and I really have to take responsibility for that. There was really no attempt to hide this plan. But in retrospect, it's very clear that the right discussions in, the, in enough detail with enough of the right people just didn't happen as this plan was unfolding. And uh, certainly, I never intended to co-opt uh, shared governance, uh, nor to uh, take curricular discussions away from the faculty. And uh, this is important to me. I have to understand that would counter my own experiences as a faculty member. Uh, and also run counter to my belief as a dean and now as an interim provost that the work of the administration is to facilitate the work that the faculty are trying to do. So in the spirit of shared governance, I did listen to you and as did Dr. Emanuel and we changed the plan. So going forward, we've separated these two entities. So the SIUE experience will be an orientation for the new freshmen and the new freshman seminar will be conducted as, as a normal course in the semester schedule. This is just a little more detail for you because I have had questions uh, from people about this, so I want to give you a little uh, more detail as I know it. So the experience is going to happen uh, Thursday through Sunday, August 16th, the freshmen move in. Their first big fun event is that night. And then there will be activities for them through the weekend. The context of it is just really orientation. It's orientation for them so they know who we are and what we do and where everything is. And uh, the goals for that orientation, uh, which is organized by student affairs now and is separated from um, the faculty, is to create a sense of community and connection to the university. We know this is very important for student retention. And it's very important uh, that it be successful because we want to retain our students as as well as we can. It's to introduce the We Are One campaign, and it is also going to introduce through some activities uh, the values of the university, the five values, and uh, I believe there is still in the plan uh, the hope to share service activity uh, on Saturday. And the contact, if you uh, need to talk to anybody about this, will be Kara Shustrin uh, from the Student Affairs Office. Now, new freshman seminar will run during the normal semester from Monday, August 20 to Friday, December 14th. Context, it's curriculum, it's courses. Uh, organizer, these courses, uh, as you'll hear more from Xenia, um, come out of the departments and are reviewed by the General Education Committee. And the goals, as written in the uh, task force report to implement the new freshman seminar, there were three major goals assist students in the transition to college level work, orient the students to the services and culture of SIUE, and engage them in the intellectual community of students and faculty. And uh, if you need a contact person for this, of course, it is Xenia, the director of general ed. So if you have ideas related to orientation, or you want to volunteer, because there will be opportunities, uh, I know that Kara is going to ask for you to nominate upper level students to be peer mentors for the freshmen. You know them best. You will know who, who the best choices for this would be. Uh, there will also be opportunities throughout the weekend to volunteer. 
Uh, I think they're going to try and create a menu, so there will be, you know, things for each day, and it will come out, and you can participate in whatever way you choose to. It is likely that the students will be grouped by major. Originally, they were going to be grouped uh, right into their uh, new freshman seminar groups, but that may not be possible. It depends on volunteers and how the plan rolls out. There is, however, the hope that we can uh, group them by their declared interest in a major, which would uh, create some opportunity for you to meet with students who are expressing some interest in your area. If you have ideas or questions about the new freshman seminar, it's going to be in, implemented as it was conceptualized. And uh, the questions about courses that are going to roll out this year will be directed to Xenia as the director of general ed. Uh, or to the members of the general ed committee. Um, if you're thinking about what might happen with this in the future, because certainly it's, it's the first time we're going to do it as it's been redesigned, um, I think that um, it is probably going to be necessary for faculty senate to create an extra committee. I think gen ed is perhaps going to be overwhelmed with what they're trying to do in the tasks they already have. And as I think about this occurring over four years, it's going to take us four years to fully implement this, I think that it's probably going to become obvious that issues are just going to keep bubbling up as, as different things are attempted in the plan and that it might be necessary to have a parallel committee that's looking at ideas for the future and issues and doing that uh, parallel and with information flowing back and forth with the Gen Ed Committee. But, you know, that'll be uh, something that I'm thinking might work, but of course that's going to be up to you. Um, just in case you don't know, these are the members of the Gen Ed, Gen Ed Committee, and this is a committee of the Senate. Uh, so we have uh, representatives from CAS, Business, Education, Engineering, Library, and Nursing. There are other representatives uh, representing students, assessment, enrollment management, registrar, uh, advising and gen ed, and I think this makes a lot of sense because of the nature of what we're trying to do. Now, going on to shared governance. Um, I see that there is, uh, and Jane mentioned it, a statement on shared governance uh, in, in your uh, handout, and I have read it, and it, 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 is, uh, it is wordier than I tend to be. I guess what I would say. So, you know, you have that version which really covers a lot of ground and you have mine which covers very, not very much. <laughs> but um, really when I think of it, I think that all the parties have to participate. So it's faculty, it is staff, it is students, and it is administration because shared governance really happens in a lot of ways and at a lot of levels and everybody, I think, has some stake. <coughs> And so in different ways, different groups get engaged. So it's really got to think about, be thought about across the whole spectrum of the uh, campus. I think you have to think about it, as Jane said, at all levels. Certainly there is a critical piece that's running back and forth between the faculty and the academic affairs office. And, you know, that's a huge piece. But there's also things going on inside of schools and inside departments. And I think that when we think about shared governance, we have to think about all of that. I think that um, what are we trying to do? Well, we're trying to advance the mission of the university. That's what we're all trying to do. The students are doing it by learning. We're doing it by providing the curriculum. Um, but I think it is really key that it's looked at as a collaborative environment, a respectful environment, and one that's mutually supportive. If we have those things, things work well. When you don't have those things, it gets very tough to work. Um, so when I think about that and expound on a little bit, I was thinking about how important communication is and, and I once heard someone say you can never have too much communication. I actually think we're at a point in our lives where we do have too much communication. Uh, if you think about the ways that we're contacted during the day, emails, cell phones, text messages, we're overloaded. And what's happening with that overload is that we're dropping the messages. I'm guilty of this. I, I expect we all at one point or another are guilty of losing track of the things that we're being contacted about. But I think if we're going to try and work toward the, you know, the goals that we want for the university, we have to engage in looking at the messages. 
uh, and we have to think about what they're asking and then communicate back if that's what's necessary. So I called it engaged for want of a better word. Um, I think we need to be very uh, conscientious about figuring out what are the right channels for this to be happening. Um, and, and Jane started to delineate it. Different committees have different responsibilities, but it usually rapidly gets more complex than that. And so I think we do have to think about, you know, if, if we're going to send a message, for instance, from the provost's office, should that message go to the deans and then to the schools? Should it go to the chairs, cc'd to the deans? Should it go to all the faculty? We have to think about which messages take which path. And the same thing would happen in every direction. And I think that um, we do have to decide as we work on projects um, and try to think about it as we work on the projects, going forward from a concept to an implementation, at which points might we need discussion and decision making, and at which points are we just sharing information, and at which points do we not care for any more information? Because we're all loaded, okay? Um, and so I think we have to think a little bit about that. I think we have to understand, you know, my, my favorite example of this is the Lincoln program. Uh, the concept for this starts back in 2003 and we're going to put the first piece of it in place hopefully in the fall of 2012, okay? Now it was a huge undertaking and projects like that need that time, but not everything that we're doing has the luxury of that kind of time. Uh, depending on who needs a report or who's asking, whether it's the Board of Trustees, the IBHE, whoever it is, we may be on completely tight time constraints. So sometimes we can ignore a message because we know it doesn't have to be answered for a while, and sometimes if you don't answer it right away, your answer is lost because the, the information had to go forward without your input. So I think we have to think about that too. When I get my request, what's the context in time around this and, you know, is, is it critical or not? Um, I think we also need to look at uh, alignment between the functional areas, especially in the provost's office, uh, with the faculty, senate committees, and subcommittees so that the right people are talking to each other. And I think this is probably the case, but I thought to myself, uh, because even as a dean, I didn't understand everything about this um, for the years I've been here. Um, who's in the provost's office? Who's trying to take care of academic affairs? And what are the duties they are trying to accomplish for, for the faculty, for the university? So, you know, the provost sits on this, on top of this, but we have academic planning and program development. Every time we want to do a new degree or a new program, there is an incredible paperwork process that begins in the department and goes to the college and goes uh, further up the line and eventually goes to the board and to, to the IBHE. Um, so in that area with planning and development, you have new programming, general ed, ed outreach, instructional services, academic advising, honors, SOAR. Then there's research and graduate school. And of course we know that would be research grants, contracts, but it's also IERC, the Illinois Education Research Center, the Institute for Urban Research, and the Corn to Ethanol, and STEM. Institutional diversity and inclusion includes diversity initiatives, peer consulting and mentoring, and the East St. Louis Center. And academic innovation and effectiveness includes senior assignment, the university's accreditation process through the HLC, which we call AQIP, it's unique, not every university does it, individual program accreditation, program reviews, which we're required to do on a regular schedule, outcome assessments for learning and success in our programming, faculty development, chair training, undergraduate research activities. Okay, so those are the four provost levels. Of course, key to all this is Jim Mannix sitting in the middle with the dollar sign. Okay. Then we have policy and communication, Andrew Tysing, who is looking at policies when he's asked. For instance, if we change a policy in a school, we have to make sure it hasn't, hasn't unaligned itself from the overriding policies of the university because that'll create problems when we try to implement something. 
So he'll do things like that. He also has a great deal of busyness around student grievances against you guys and <laughs> faculty grievances. Today he came to me, someone just doesn't like the course they're in and they're very mad that it isn't what they thought it would be. You know? So you never know what the form will take of the unhappiness, but it's frequent. Of course, Mark Bacchus is doing all the contracts for all, all the departments. He's the negotiator for the non-tenure track union, and he is also immigration support. So if you bring in new faculty and they need visas, this is in Mark's area of responsibility. Jennifer, as you know, takes care of all things IT, including now some instructional things going on in the summer to certify people for online teaching. And then Scott, as enrollment management, is taking care of registrar, admissions, financial aid, and career development. I think I've got everybody. Jane, how am I doing? I'm okay or I'm done? I'm done. She said I'm done. Okay. I think I only have two more slides. So, um, so I thought about shared governance and I said to myself, I think that I've already seen some examples of this going on. It's not that we don't have it. It's just that we wish it was better. And I think we can make it better. We can make it work better. But the student evaluation of teaching, which was an AQUIP project, that, that required great work between the provost's office and the faculty at every level. Um, the Senate assessment committees require help from the provost's office. The University Quality Council includes academic affairs, student affairs, <coughs> staff senate, student senate, faculty senate, and vice chancellors. That's just about everybody you could possibly have at a table. Um, when we needed to change a policy on IT access because of a, an audit finding, Jennifer came to the Senate to talk about needing the language to change. Um, last year you approved a change in the admission standards for students when Scott came to you to talk to you about that. Um, new degree program development, the last two we've done, Doctor of Nursing Practice and, uh, and the Doctor of Educational Leadership. Those required work between schools and, and the provost's office. So I think we do this, but as I said, I think we can do it better. So with that, I'm going to end by turning this over to what the program is really supposed to be about, which is the Lincoln Program. Oh, I have to say this. Thank you. If you want that tight chart that you really couldn't see from the back of the room on who's responsible for what, I have them up here for you. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Very good. Um, all right, our next speaker is Kathleen Tunney. Uh, she is going to talk to us about Bridge, uh, and this will bring us the historical aspects of what is now the Lincoln Program. Well, thank you, Jane. Thank you, Ann. I think that the Whoa. physical presence of all of us demonstrates shared governance better than almost anything else could. Um, first off, I want to thank you for inviting me to talk about this historical piece, and I will be brief, um, but there's a lot of other people in the room and out of the room that could have done as well as I hope I can do in describing these events. Um, so I'm honored to be asked, and uh, uh, I will give you a short history per, uh, perspective. Um, just a note on the schedule, um, Paul and Zini and I have agreed to share the next hour, so from 1.30 to 2.30 we'll share this time um, so that we can do the breakout groups and get going on some of the, the fizziness and excitement of general education um, that we want to reinforce. <clears throat> so again, thank you. And uh, I do have a handout. I'm, I'm real old school, but I didn't make enough for everybody. So maybe I'll ask Vicki and Jane if it can be placed on the Faculty Senate website for everybody to look at. And I have them available. Maybe at the breakout groups, I can throw a few in, in your direction. <coughs> I'll only go back to 1975. No, I'm, I'm kidding. No, no groans. Um, but the reason that I use that time frame of the 70s, 80s, and 90s is that shared governance and faculty and staff, student, and administration dialogue on general education reform has a history that's that long. Um, we have been talking and thinking and making a national reputation for ourselves and our institution for some close on 40 years now in this area. And I think that that's important to remember. Back in the mid-70s, there was a conference that related to what is a liberal education. SIUE was invited to the table to discuss those issues. We were in on the early days, many know 
of the AACNU, American Association of Colleges and Universities. Well, this institution was on board when it was AAC, <laughs> when universities first came to be included in that organization, SIUE was at the table, and that was, sort of, I think, mid-80s. So there's a longer history than the period that I'm going to focus on, which is basically 2002, 2003 uh, to 2007, when the bridge program uh, was approved. Specifically, I, my role was as chair of the Curriculum Council and then later as president of the Faculty Senate when these issues were being debated and discussed. So 2002, 2003 to 2005 was something that some of you remember as the Objectives Project. How many people in the room remember the Objectives Project? Excellent. Some of you were involved in that as well. The Objectives Project was designed to look at, well, the objectives of general education at this institution, which had not been examined for some period of years prior uh, to this time. The starting point and the precursor to the bridge effort was to say, do our objectives for general education match what we want for this institution, its aims, and the types of students that we are educating? That was widely um, staffed by by some people who were in the room, some people who have, have left this institution, but it did involve students, faculty, staff, and administration. Uh, what we did is look at the objectives of general education and ask the question, do these fit for us still? And the answer essentially was yes, they do. That they could be tweaked in some kind of ways, but basically after broad review and discussion, those objectives were validated and adopted by this institution. And then, from there, the Bridge Committee and ensuing activity developed. So 2005, 2006, um, that period of time, the design teams were created. There was lots of percolation going on, lots of discussions, lots of debate. The Bridge Committee, upon which I served, and many in the room recall and, and were part of, um, guided the process. Our attempt, even as, as a steering committee, was not to drive the process, but simply to facilitate its successful conclusion. Um, those culminated in that all-faculty meeting that reviewed the options that had been des designed, and including, as Zinia and I, Zinia reminded me the other day, no change. In some sense, academics are both progressive and regressive. <laughs> we like change, but we don't like change. And my clinical background is in family therapy, so uh, that helped in my uh, years of working with senates and various other committees it was hugely helpful so one of the options on the table at that time was let's keep what we have and the faculty decided that was not um, what they wanted to do and, and so we went forward um, again in the interest of time i know you don't want the whole history lesson um, some of these materials on who was involved and the processes are available on the general education website, so please feel free to refer to those. Because I think we want to move forward, and the history is important, but the future is even more so. And like other speakers, I'd like to share my two cents worth on what shared governance means to me and meant to me as a result of the processes I was involved in. And that first, my first point is shared governance is messy. It would be much easier for all of us just to say, okay, I'm going to do my job and I'm going to do what I want to do and what I think is right, and the rest of you can just do whatever you want to do. It's much messier for faculty, staff, students, administration, everybody to have these conversations, as we've learned in um, recent days, weeks, months, years ago and forward. So shared governance is messy. In some sense, too, not only is shared governance related to faculty administration relationships is related to faculty-faculty relationships. I think in the implementation of Bridge, we see that we all have to somehow merge what we're doing in a way that serves the interests of the institution and the students. And sometimes that means giving up something in order to receive that larger benefit. So that's messy. Now I'm going to talk about marriage. Believe me, there is a point, and I do have one. And that is, one of the ways that we were able to move forward, both a new freshman seminar concept and the um, uh, reform of general education, was to come to the Senate and say, trying to overcome some of the objections that say, yes, but, or what if, all of the detail that people were 
rightly asking about. But what the idea is, is like marriage, you commit to the person and the shared goal. You work out the details every day, every morning, every year. You work out the details. And so what we were able to do is to decouple the concept from the implementation so that we could say, okay, let's say we really want this. We want a new freshman seminar experience for our students. We want to look at general education in some kind of depth and breadth. Let's commit to those ideas. The Senate then established committees that said the details need to be figured out. We have to honor those concerns of departments and academic units. But let's marry. Let's get married. <laughs> then we'll figure out how we're going to live together. And so that's essentially what happened with the new freshman seminar as well as the general education reform effort is that the Senate supported the idea. And with the caveat that it would be reevaluated, that there would be committees and they'd come back to the Senate at periodic times saying what's going on, the opportunity for review being built in. So that's my wedding vows <laughs> definition of shared governance. And a last word on the road ahead. Um, I think that as with marriage or any good corporate effort, whether it's personal or professional, we have to remember why we're here. What's the point here? Why do we engage in these messy processes and try to engage in these shared commitments? Because we're interested in student learning, professional development, development of ideas. And people who can make a contribution to the world as a result of having a degree from us. That is the most important thing. I don't, in my idea, that's, nothing is more important than that. Now these controversies come and go, but that commitment remains. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thanks very much. Uh, so uh, my role in this presentation and indeed in the whole process of looking at uh, general education reform and the bridge process in particular was to chair the implementation committee, which again takes it from concept to implementation and, and required a lot of thought, a lot of work. I began to overlap with the bridge committee itself in its last year, 2007, 2008, and then took over the implementation committee in 2008. A place to start with uh, discussion, I think, of, of uh, mechanism that's been useful to discuss this is to look at the structure of the current program and the structure of the new program, which is on a sheet that I think a lot of you picked up on the way in. This is a sort of graphic representation of the current program with uh, skills courses at the bottom and two major sets of courses that can be chosen by students in this skills requirement. There are then these <laughs> intro courses, a pattern of intro <laughs> courses. Students have to have five of them in one of three configurations. There are then the distribution uh, courses that they need with one from each of the intellectual areas of social sciences, natural science, mathematics, and fine arts and humanities. And then these experiential requirements of the in intergroup relations, the international issues, international culture, which sort of can weave through here. Students can have courses that, that carry these as tags. Uh, and then from there you have the integrative components of interdisciplinary studies and then finally the senior assignment. So this is the, this is the general education experience for uh, a student um, in the current <coughs> program. What was envisioned by the bridge proposal, what was envisioned by the Lincoln plan then was this sort of a structure. There's probably any of a number of ways that this could have been drawn, but this is what came to my sick little mind as I was going through it. So, it's a very much simplified 
sort of proposal now. There are these foundations courses. There's five of them. All students take all five, okay? There are then a series of distribution, these breadth courses over here in these uh, six uh, intellectual areas, life sciences, physical sciences, fine and performing arts, humanities, um, um, uh, information communication society, yes, thank you, social sciences. There are now four experiential requirements that students have to have U.S. cultures and global cultures a lab experience and then a health experience and again these can be woven through these courses and then the new freshman seminar then was very intentionally addressed to play a much more uh, uh, prominent role in the the first year for students and be integrated into the program in the in the current program new freshman seminar came along after that program was developed and and was never tightly integrated into the series of requirements here and so uh, the, the bridge process provided a very good opportunity to work new freshman seminar into the whole process. So there are some key aspects to these changes that I think are worth pointing out for the interests of advisors as well as for students. Um, the Lincoln program is more streamlined. There are fewer hours and courses that are required for students to take to complete it. Uh, Jennifer Reg in anthropology uh, went through every single degree program in the catalog for all schools and rewrote every single degree program to show students how they could finish all of the requirements of the Lincoln program within a four-year uh, term. Those are in the bridge proposal. Um, having fewer hours in the general education program then helps really to build toward having a 120-hour graduation requirement for SAUE, which is one of the last schools to have 124 hours required for graduation. So the new Lincoln program really leaves that door open and provides that opportunity. There are a series of distinctions now between the Bachelor of Arts and Bachelor of Science. I, I won't go into details about them. They're in the proposal. You can read about them. Uh, it very clearly, though, draws a distinction then between Bachelor of Arts and what's valued there and Bachelor of Science and what's valued there. It may very well result in some departments who currently offer Bachelor of Science degrees dropping those degrees. It may result in some departments who offer Bachelor of Arts degrees dropping those degrees, which sounds like you're limiting opportunities for students. But indeed, this is one of the most heavily supported components to this proposal as it, as it matured. The new freshman seminar is now um, well integrated into the program. Uh, there are challenges in implementation in terms of making sure enough seats are offered. But there was a very good general discussion about clarifying the role that new freshman seminar is playing, the components that should be included in courses classified as new freshman seminar, and so in, so on. And then the proposal called for a reduction in the section sizes of IS courses down to 25 students per instructor. So as to return the original ideas in interdisciplinary study courses of significant writing components, closer mentoring between faculty and students, things like that. Um, and then the bridge proposal gave provisions for a very systematic review and assessment of the components of the Lincoln program. There really was not a systematic, clear way of, of parsing out review of the current general education program, and the, and the Lincoln program really provides for that. So um, as Kathleen actually alluded to just a few moments ago, the role of the, the, role of the next step then was to go from concept of blueprint. It was to begin to really implement this right brain to left brain strategy to logistics. The committee was named Bridge Implementation Committee, the BIC, as it was referred to, which got ridiculed a few times. Uh, Kay Covington did that, I, I think, really just to irritate me primarily. Um, and so again, in thinking about it as a model of shared governance, one of the one of the easiest ways to argue the manifestation of shared governance is the mm, tendrils of influence that had to emerge from this committee to create a workable plan. On a very simple level, the faculty, senate, and the office of the provost worked very well together to create the BIC. And when you're doing this, when you're now saying, this is what you want, referring to the faculty, then this is what we're going to do. And therefore, that means you have to combine creatively the concept of carrots with the concept of sticks. And so you have the idea of saying the faculty senate is 
you will do this, you will execute this charge with the support of and under the authority of the Faculty Senate. And the Office of the Provost backed up the Faculty Senate very reciprocally by saying you will execute this charge with the support of the Office of the Provost and, by the way, with the authority of the Office of the Provost. So it was an interesting sort of um, uh, diplomatic series of lines to walk along in terms of moving departments forward. From the bridge proposal, the bridge proposal uh, called for a restructuring of the General Education Committee um, out of the Faculty Senate. And the bridge proposal called for the creation of the Director of General Education position in the Office of the Provost. These become then the long-term mentors of the Lincoln program as it moves forward. I got the little sailing ship as a you know, visual link there. And so these are to work together to keep the, the program going. And again, the proposal itself provided the directive to both the Faculty Senate and the Office of the Provost to work those forward. Um, so then I referred earlier to the, the tendrils. So it is worthwhile, I think, especially for those not familiar with the program, to think about all that is involved in putting a new general education program like this forward and what needs to happen. So if we begin with the BIC as a central entity on campus, uh, one recognizes, for example, uh, one has to work very closely with the Office of the Registrar. There are a series of changes that need to take place with respect to degree requirements and audits because students are now coming in under a new program, there's fewer hours required and so on. All of those course designations, when you look at current models of the catalog where it says intro NSM or something like that in little letters, all of those designations have to be turned into the designations for the Lincoln program, which is going is a huge job. Catalog descriptions may change um, depending on how departments view a course uh, playing a role in the Lincoln program. <laughs> Banner is going to have to be educated in how to do this, and that that'll be fun to watch. Um, and then there is the grandfathering aspect. If we picture a student who enrolled in 2009, attended for a year and a half, and then returns in 2013 to finish their degree, that's Laura's problem. I'm not going to worry about it. But, <laughs> but that grandfathering issue really becomes, a, becomes an issue. Another tendril that comes out of this uh, is, is the role that BIC had to play in going to talk to schools and departments. Um, and I had a, a large series of meetings with department chairs and even with deans of schools to talk about a variety of the effects that were coming with the Lincoln program. There was something referred to as the breadth deficit. Um, uh, the idea of shifting from a two-tiered system of, of general education requirements of those, uh, of those courses to a single tier means that some departments will likely experience uh, a great reduction in the demand for some of their gen ed courses. And that effort then that's being expended there has to be redirected productively. Uh, the offering of new freshman seminar seats, that you, you have to ensure that there are enough seats coming online to handle all of the new students that are coming. IS collaborations and the, the new freshman seminar seats and IS collaborations, this here is the primary function, I think, of this afternoon. And re I really encourage people to think about this because this is going to be a really interesting problem to think about. The, the issue with IS collaborations is that with smaller sections in interdisciplinary studies courses, if we're going to offer, let's just say, 2,000 seats per year, there has to be an increase in the number of instructors who are willing to offer um, IS classes or there won't be enough seats offered. So this really needs to um, increase in a very productive way. Uh, and then the impact of the foundations courses is going to be potentially fairly significant, particularly with respect to the QR 101 course, the Quantitative Reasoning 101 course, uh, because it's a n completely new course that will have to handle all that demand in the speech department. Um, 103, 104, and 105 will no longer be the avenues that students will take at Speech 101, they have to have that class, and so that will bring a, a big demand into that class. Reasoning and Argumentation 101 is meant to be a, a redesign and, and resynthesis of Philosophy 106. 
Um, and then the English 101 and 102 courses, which are already playing such a primary role, will, will still be playing that role in the foundations of the Lincoln program. Uh, we then had to interact with Scott Bellabredic, Vice Chancellor for Enrollment Management, and we had to get uh, we had to get estimates for the number of students being admitted each year that that ranged from the frightening to the really frightening. I mean, in terms of, I mean, I shouldn't complain, right? Because we're getting a new building out of this kind of growth. But but on the other hand, when you sit down and you say, how many professors do we have to recruit to offer 2,000 seats a year in interdisciplinary studies courses? That becomes a fairly um, daunting sort of demand. These numbers become affected by recruitment and retention roles. How nice that this now runs in parallel with the change in the funding to state schools that would be based on retention and graduation. So this, this runs in parallel with a focus that we're already going to be putting on recruitment and retention, which will help with some aspects of determining the number of uh, seats that we need for the Lincoln program. Um, and, and also, this retention stuff feeds into resident hall programs, the transition of students onto campus, the new freshman seminar, the freshman experience, which begins to uh, uh, include the Student Affairs Office. Uh, another tendril then, academic advising. Um, this is going to be uh, very tricky. In the same way that a student who matriculated before the Lincoln program and then continues beyond or returns to campus well into the Lincoln program implementation is going to have issues of lining up those requirements, students that are transferring from other schools there could be issues of lining up what they're taking at other schools with, with ours. The hope is that the Lincoln program actually provides for a more seamless transition, but uh, academic advising will have to deal a lot with uh, transfer and communicating with all of the IAI um, institutions, and then advisement will have to be very careful in terms of thinking about where students are in the Lincoln program requirements. Uh, so then, in thinking about uh, dollars. As a biologist, I tend to either think of like dollar sunfish or like sand dollars or something. And so in the implementation proposal, I made a huge long series of tables where I, I got data from various offices on campus to think about instructor salaries, lecturer salaries, professor salaries, all the different departments, assuming a pay raise of X, looking at years of implementation, I think out to 2014 after campus. Woven through all of this, then, of course, is the necessary support of the Office of the Provost. I mean, at some level, Faculty Senate isn't determining budgets. The Office of the Provost will be helping with that in terms of thinking about hiring faculty to support, especially the Foundations courses. Um, and this led to the formation of what was referred to as the Bridge Reconciliation Committee, which operated for about a year or so, something like that. Um, and we finally converged, I think, at the end where the numbers weren't too bad. I mean, you know, I think people felt pretty good about it, but, you know, it was just, it was those big numbers in bold face type that I had in the thing that really was like, Cut! okay. Um, so this is, this was the role of the Bridge Implementation Committee, and the, the thing to stress is the number of entities on campus that had to be involved. The committee itself had representatives from nearly every unit on campus. It was an excellent committee. I really enjoyed working with them. And Everyone on campus was very responsive to the needs of the committee in terms of dealing with the provost's office, with deans, individual chairs. I was allowed to attend faculty meetings and I would sit with faculty of whole departments and talk to them about the implementation of the program. So it was a, it was a very good example of taking something, um, as, as Kathleen referred to, from an idea now to how do you actually do this and, and, and keep it aligned with what faculty wanted originally. Okay. So that's all I have. Are there any questions about the implementation committee activities? No? Excellent. Good. Okay. Thanks. <laughs>
Okay, so we've seen that we've been doing this work since 2003, almost a decade later. We're ready to roll it out. Okay, um, from what you've heard from Kathleen and Paul, a lot of people have been involved in this. So now we're ready to look into the future. Fall 2012 is the initial phase of the implementation. We have to wait until fall of 2015 in order for the Lincoln program to be fully implemented. So what have been happening since the Faculty Senate approved, the Reconciliation Committee said, okay, we're ready to go. Fall of 2010, all reports have notice we have the bridge, we have the BIC, the Implementation Committee, the new freshman seminar was a separate Implementation Committee. So all of those re uh, reports were presented to the Faculty Senate. If you, you have problems getting to those reports, I know they're in different sites in the university, but we have all of them in that website. Okay? And so you will see who are the people involved in the committees, what were the uh, recommendations of those different committees. Now one of the things that the implementation committee recommended was that all the changes in designations as we go from introduction, uh, introductory and distribution courses to our breadth areas, that they have to go through a fast track um, process. So we had the Lincoln, Programs Desig Lincoln Program Designations Committee that looked at all those proposals for changes and approvals were forwarded to the Curriculum Council. And I would like to commend this committee and the chair is here, Susan Yeager. For two semesters, they worked on what, more than 500 proposals, going through them and making sure that they were meeting all the requirements that were specified in the Lincoln program. So again, uh, the schools that were generally offering gen ed courses are represented and we have Joe Gibson from the registrar's office who provided insight into, well, how do we deal with this whenever we have transfer courses? Then we have, in addition to changes, now with the new things in the Lincoln program, some um, departments were saying, well, we can acquire Lincoln program designations for our courses. So those requests were are, and are still being processed by the Gen Ed Committee. And I have Tom Jordan here, who's chairing the Gen Ed Committee, and he knows that that could also be a painful process, especially when you ask for revisions. Okay? And in addition to the courses, so we have changes in designations, acquisition of designations, now program changes will also have to come into play because of the new requirements specifically for the BABS that Paul alluded to earlier. Now those program changes are processed by the Curriculum Council. Now there are also policy changes. So there were policy changes within the Lincoln program report, but there are also some other policy changes in the background that have to be change or that have to be implemented in order to reflect the Lincoln program requirements. And you've seen this in the list that Jane had, for instance, the gen ed requirements for honor students. We have the transfer policies and as well as the proficiency policies for our gen ed courses because under the Lincoln program, students can only proficiency out of a total of five gen ed courses. Okay, so there would be a limit. Now this is the biggie, and I know that chairs were contacted with this. We need to have the catalog edits for the fall 2012 catalog. So this was carried on by the individual departments, the registrar's office, and the office of the provost. Okay, so where are we headed to? So fall of 2012. So because we have limited resources, we need to carry out the implementation <coughs> over three years. What are we looking forward to in fall of 2012? We'll have a hybrid gen ed. So the skills remain. The ones in red are the new ones. So the skills courses remain. Intro and distribution go out. They get replaced by breath areas. IS remains, but we now have the experiences. 
So the new freshman seminar is part of those experiences. And the other one that would kick in would be the BA versus BS requirements. Now all of this changes from year to year. Laura Strong actually was very good in coming up with a guide. So the resource that you have underneath there, that's where you will find the requirements every year as we transition under the Lincoln program. Now, Paul d said he d didn't want to go into the details, but I believe that a lot of people are still not clear about what really is the distinction between BA and BS, wh and why does it make such a big deal to, other de to some departments more than others. So notice that for the Bachelor of Science, they now have eight courses in the sciences. So life, physical, social sciences, and they need two labs. For Bachelor of Arts, they also need eight courses, but those have to be in the fine and performing arts and humanities, and they still have a two semester sequence of a foreign language. So think about this in math, because that's what I'm familiar with. So math, we cover all of our physical sciences because math is classified under physical sciences. We have physics, so we're set with our A. But if we offer a BA in math, then we're in trouble because we need eight courses in FPA and humanities. So they can get those two from their breadth courses, but they still need six others. So they can get two, from the foreign language, which they now require, so I still need two more. And what do we know about our programs right now? We don't really have spaces for electives. Okay, Laura and I went through all of the programs, and a lot of the programs don't really have any space for their electives. So departments are looking more closely into their programs and that's what Paul said some of the departments are actually thinking of doing away with their BA if they're more into the sciences or doing away with their BS if they're more into the arts now what happens after a year the foundations kick in and even the foundations they have phases so we have foundations phase one what does that entail? Here, the time constraints. So this is where things get a little bit messy. So in concept, the Lincoln program said foundations have to be completed within the first 60 hours. Well, that's good. But now we're actually going to implement it. So English 101 has to be completed within the first 30 hours. English 102 within the first 45. Now. There are no substitutions for English because we already have them right now. Quantitative Reasoning 101, that's an entirely new course. So for the first phase, we're allowing substitutions. Any math that's at the pre-calculus level or higher. So the engineers were happy because they can substitute okay, for that particular year. Okay? But that still has to be completed within the first 60 hours. Reasoning and Argumentation 101, which as Paul said is the redesigned um, critical thinking course, they, that can be re, um, substituted by Philosophy 207, which is Probability and Decisions, and or Philosophy 213, which is Introduction to Deductive Logic. Is that correct, Sue? Yeah. Okay. That has to be completed within the first 60 hours then SpeechCom 101 can still be replaced by interpersonal speech communication, which is 103, but that has to be completed within the first 30 hours. So what are some of the things that we need to be thinking about? What do we do with the students who don't meet the time constraints? Well, some people said, well, then tough luck. What will that do to our retention? Okay, so we have that problem where in concept it's good, but once we start implementing it, we have to think of creative ways to be able to meet what we originally wanted. Now, fall of 2014, foundations phase two. We take away some of the substitutions. Okay, so no changes to English, 
Now math has to be at the calculus level or higher. Okay. Now philosophy, we take away philosophy 207, it has to be philosophy 213. And we make the time shorter. So instead of within the first 60, now it's within the first 45 hours. We still have the same for speech comm 101 or 103. Finally, fall of 2015, if you're all still here at the time, okay, and you haven't retired because of, our pe of the way that our pension plans are going, <laughs> we'll have the Lincoln program fully implemented, which means what? No more substitutions. Okay? So all our incoming freshmen in fall of 2015 will have to take all of those courses as we have originally designed. Okay. So are there any questions? Yes, Christine. Well, right now the registrar's office is already working on that. So we have we still have the articulations. We can't go away from that. So um, they have, in fact, when you go to those course guides that the registrar's office has, they have the IAI numbers for the courses that would transfer in. Our only problem would be our QR and our RA because there are very few schools that actually have a quantitative reasoning. Okay? Now, what the registrar's office is proposing is that we will grandfather in all transfer students until Lincoln program is fully implemented. And personally, I think that's fair. Because as we keep changing our requirements, we can't expect the community colleges to keep following what our requirements are. So I believe fall 2015, no more excuses. So whether you're native or you're transfer, if you come in at SIUE, you will be subject to the Lincoln program requirements. Now, we have this continuous review. So according to the Lincoln program, three years after each component of the Lincoln program is in place, there has to be a review. And Tom, if I, we can talk him into still being the chair of the Janet committee, <laughs> the Janet committee is in charge of reviewing the Lincoln program on a cycle. So since the first component is the breath area, three years, which is fall 2015, we will review together with the Janet committee the courses. Now, how that review will take place that's still being talked about with the Committee on Assessment because what we don't want to happen is to have a drift. So all courses will actually be reviewed and I believe in the um, redesign of the working papers of the Janet Committee. The Janet Committee actually has the authority to put courses on probation if they are not meeting the original goals of the Lincoln program. Yes. So will beta or something else put a block up for students, let's say from English, if a student is in 35 hours and doesn't have English 101, they, they get some sort of... They are flagged. They will be flagged. Okay. So what um, Laura Strom is... Say, um, this is the most efficient way that she can think of, given our banner um, constraints, okay. is that at the end of each semester, students will be checked in terms of the foundations. So if they have not satisfied the time constraints, they will be flagged, then they will be required to register for it in the next succeeding term. So that's one possible solution. We're still exploring other solutions, but that's the most practical because we can't just say, kick them all out. We'll wipe out our student population. <laughs> and we will not have a job. So, <laughs> yes. Zinia, could you go back to the slide about the BA and BS sure. uh, distinctions? Oh. Let 
There you go. And you said this goes into effect as of this fall for right. incoming freshmen. Yes. Okay. So it's only for incoming freshmen because everybody who entered, they follow the catalog on the year that they entered, and that catalog is in effect. Each catalog is in effect for seven years. assessment plan will be developed by the committee on assessment. So I'm working with the committee on assessment. Is Denise in here? Um, we have a general education strategic committee that's actually working right now, and I can see some of the members. Joel Hardman, since he's the um, <coughs> chair of COA, we're actually trying to think of a way to be able to measure the student learning outcomes. Because remember, we didn't change our gen ed goals. So we're trying to find a way to assess it without imposing <coughs> too much on the faculty. So what, we're, what we are trying to work on is if we can get artifacts that are intrinsic to the course and not something that's superficial. But all of that is still in the works. If you don't have any more questions, thank you very much. Well, it looks like we're going to have a lot of time for the roundtables. Um, I'll offer one more chance to ask questions uh, about the Senate or anything you've, uh, you've heard us talk about today. Uh, now, I think, are you the facilitating student or are you going to? Well, it's me and Zoom. Okay, good. So, we have the instructions on the round tables. Uh, this is Sue Whittaker, our uh, curriculum council chair. So, as you can tell, this room is not really designed for round tables. <laughs> you may have been wondering about that. But it's all part of the grand design because this is an all faculty meeting. And so, part of what we want you to do is to meet people especially people you don't normally see because they come from other parts of campus. So we're actually all going to migrate down the hall to the, the River Roots, Mississippi, Illinois, which are set up with lovely round tables. On each table, you'll find two sheets, one that has the old and new expectations for new freshman seminar to help clarify the difference between the existing new freshman seminars and what they're going to look like this upcoming fall. And there's another sheet that makes the distinction for the interdisciplinary studies courses, what they look like now, and what the changes and requirements are going to be. We're leaving it pretty open. We wanted to capture that busyness of having people, you know, and talking. So we've got two broad categories that we thought you might sort yourself into. So if you're really interested in talking about new freshman seminar, how to get those experiences, integrated into an academic setting, okay? If you would sort of head towards the tables closer to the windows in that room. If what you want to do is meet other people in the room and brainstorm ideas for interdisciplinary studies, because you're a dentist in Alton and you don't get a chance to talk to <laughs> artists very often, and that's an exciting idea. <clears throat> head towards the tables that are closer to the doors that come in, just to kind of sort yourselves by those two broad categories. There's easels set up all around the room, so as you have great ideas, put them up there, share them. In particular, the questions that were asked during the Q&A just now. How are we going to assess and monitor? What are we going to do with people that, that don't meet our time restrictions? If you branch into those topics, please brainstorm any idea you get. Put it up on those, those boards so that we can capture those and share that more broadly and bring those things to Gen Ed and Curriculum Council and everybody else who's working on this. But what we'd really like you to do is brainstorm exciting ideas for interdisciplinary studies, 
because you got everybody from across the university, and really think about how you're going to do new freshman seminars, experiences in an academic way. Those are the things. Um, so as you walk down there, this is a great opportunity to go, I came here with the people that are in the office next to me. Don't sit down with them. <laughs> Sit down with people you don't know and meet people from across the university to spark ideas. Is that covered? Mm -hmm. So, you go out the door, you hang a left, and you're just going to take off. I want, I want to thank all the speakers. Yes. Okay.